Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's web conference, the CNR May 2024 market update. My name is Amber Ortiz, and I am a senior vice president and team lead here at City National Bank, and will be moderating today's presentation. I'm joined by several key leaders from CNR Investment Strategy, including Chief Investment Officer Charles Luke, Senior Economist and Portfolio Manager Paul Single, and the Head of Fixed Income Michael Taylor. The views and estimates you hear today are sourced from our Investment Committee's weekly meetings. During today's call, our presenters will explore key themes for markets ahead and the implications for client portfolios in 2024. At the end of the presentation, we will all be on the line to answer any of the questions we receive from you during the webinar. So please do not forget to put in your questions in the console's Q&A window anytime during the session. You can also download the presentation materials using the resource window on the right side of your console. I now turn the call over to Charles Luke with City National Rockdale. Thanks, Amber, uh, and welcome everybody to today's call. It's nice to have you with us. So I wanted to start uh, today and really give you an update on our strategy, so our speedometers, um, and then our outlook. And then we'll move into some big themes we see in the market um, as we move across the board in a different segment. So I wanted to start here um, on our speedometer page. Our market outlook essentially has been stable since the last time we were together. Uh, we do believe that the current data is coming in nicely relative to our expectations. Uh, just to note some of our last changes, uh, the last thing that we did do was shift our international, international economic outlook up. Um, and the market certainly has confirmed that, especially with what we're seeing on some of the global central bank fronts um, as far as the easing cycle is concerned. Uh, we also continue to believe in a very strong consumer. Um, and so our green dials that go across sentiment, labor, and spending um, are all positive, and we think they should remain there. Um, and Paul's going to do a deep dive on consumer spending, so looking forward to that. And then we think about earnings. The Q1 earnings season confirmed our positive outlook um, on earnings later this year, um, and certainly it was a very positive uh, above market expectations Q1. We also see very open credit markets. Mike's going to dive a little bit into what we've been seeing on the new issuance front, um, and that's been quite astounding as we started the year. Um, and so if I go back up a level and take a look overall, we do see the probability of a recession this year is very low. And we believe there's a solid foundation uh, and a backdrop here that's really driving markets. And so to shift into some of our specific economic forecasts, again, we don't have any major changes here, but just to do a little bit of a review, we do expect a slowdown, um, a moderate slowdown in the economy as we move into 2024. So our range for GDP is between 1.75 and 2.25% by the end of the year. And some of the data that we're seeing coming in on GDP appears to confirm that. And then in 2025, we're also keeping a range of between one and a half to two and a quarter for full year growth. I mentioned the Q1 earnings season um, and a lot of the, the positive momentum that we've received in the market from there. Um, so we've stated our nine to 12% earnings forecast for 2024. Um, we also see reason to be relatively optimistic moving in 2025. Um, and I'll also talk about a broadening of those earnings expectations, which we feel is a key component to the markets being able to move uh, above current levels. And then shifting to inflation, this has been one of the most frustrating things that we've seen all year. We get data prints that it's moving higher. We see some that potentially it's moving lower. But ultimately, we think our ranges are in the right place. Um, so if you take our headline CPI number, 275 to 3.5%, the last print there was about 3.6%. So if we have just a moderate glide path to the downside here into the end of the year, we're gonna be within that 275 to 3.5% range. And we see similar data coming in on core CPI. And then the last comment to update everyone is just what we see on Fed funds. So what the Fed is going to do, we have a range of between 475 and five and a half. So we think we could see anywhere from zero to three cuts. The probability has increased that we don't see any cuts this year. Uh, but I think the willingness from the Fed is there. And so if they get the right data coming in, we think they'll be relatively quick to move, uh, but will not do more than one to two cuts. And then we continue to be in the higher for longer camp with our 10-year Treasury expectations between 4.1 and 4.6, and st staying elevated into next year north of 4%. So as we move into today's, today's agenda beyond just our forecasts, um, I wanted to give a quick highlight of all the different segments we're going to touch on. So I'm going to spend some time now talking about um, what we're watching, so some of the major global things, themes from an election standpoint, um, and some of the geopolitical tensions. I also wanted to introduce some concepts around what we think could be long-term implications from the election, 
Um, and then I'd also like to talk a little bit about global central banks. And from there, we're gonna move into Paul's section, talk about the macroeconomic backdrop. He's gonna give us an update on the consumer, uh, the state of the labor market, and a little bit on housing. And then we'll hear from Mike and fixed income um, on the attractiveness of yield and some of our recommendation, recommendations there. And then I'll finish this off with the equity side of things. So to jump right into the geopolitical side, um, what I wanted to do was zoom in a little bit here because I know we all hear about big risks out there, especially with respect to global elections. But let's take a look at just what's happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I'd like to start with what's happening in Mexico on June 2nd, which is just coming up this Sunday. Um, and so I don't want to get into too much detail, um, but essentially it looks like the front runner for the Mexican presidential election um, is coming in and is part of the existing party, which is called Morena. The key aspect here that we're watching is whether or not they can get a super majority um, in Congress. And the reason markets are concerned about that is because that could result in widespread constitutional amendments, which could shake the market a little bit. And if we bring that back to the US, what the implications are here is that Mexico did overtake China last year as the lead trading partner for the US under the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. You may have heard this referred to as the USMCA. And so the implications that we're watching and what could be destabilizing is that Mexico remains a key trading partner to the U.S. And we all know the issues in our own country around immigration policies, which is likely to be a flashpoint coming up in November. So it has been strategically important to us, uh, certainly as a nearshoring option uh, for U.S. companies. And so any election volatility that we see could create unease and threaten the trade agreement um, and create some free flow trading issues. Um, so we're looking very closely at how that election impact could impact the rhetoric we see in November. The second thing that I wanted to mention is what's happening with European Parliament elections. So what will happen here is that between June 6th and 8th, um, EU citizens are gonna elect about 720 members for the next EU Parliament, and they stay in place for about five years. So it's critically important in terms of what the balance of power ends up being here, um, especially for key growth prospects across Europe. And what we're concerned about here is that some of the more fringe groups are likely uh, to gain on the centrist majority right now. And that could have implications um, impacting clean energy policy in Europe, as well as the industrial side and certainly EU defense policies, which is a core concern of ours with respect to Russia and Ukraine. So we don't think the outcome of these elections are going to derail the current agenda, but it is a litmus test for the popularity and support of some of these French candidates. So the implication for us here is as we're thinking through international, international developed market investing, the EU is the next largest developed country market in the world next to the US. And so there are reasons to be optimistic about some European growth prospects right now, um, but, but we do see the potential for these elections to cause some threats to the Euro bloc, and that could create unease, um, even though the centrists will remain in control. So it is an important factor for us in any decision that we'd make to invest into European markets. But the most important concept that I wanted to discuss on this page is what's happening with China and Taiwan. So if you've been listening to us for the past couple of months, we certainly acknowledge um, the issues around Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Hamas. But we do believe that what's happening with China and Taiwan and the U.S.-China relationships broadly will have the biggest long-term impact on, uh, on us moving forward. And so I wanted to mention that last Monday, Taiwan's new president was sworn in um, and his public address did draw a clear distinction between Taiwan and China, which did upset China and, and they did view that as threatening. So in response, China mounted a large scale military exercise around Taiwan, and this was the first of its kind um, in about a year. And it was cited as a direct result of the new president's comments. And so if we take this situation combined with the Biden administration's extension of Section 301 tariffs. So those are the tariffs that went in place when Trump came into power. And then we consider some of the new tariffs, and we'll talk about that. We really think the starting gun has gone off with what will be a political battle as we move into November. But the key risk here, and I think this is a great illustration of how we think about positioning our portfolios, is that Taiwan is the place where most semiconductor manufacturing takes place. And it has broad sweeping implications Again, that serves as a good example of how we think about risk within our portfolios. And just to kind of give you a lay of the land, the two most important groups um, in Taiwan for semiconductors comes from AI design companies. So that's like NVIDIA, but also capital equipment providers. These provide high-tech machines for a lot of these advanced chip developments. 
And so in the event that Taiwan is impacted, we're running scenarios on our exposures and looking at decisions that we can make now to limit the potential market impact um, from what could be um, an extension of, of the conflicts um, and things that we're seeing there. So we've been moderately reducing our positions to those capital equipment providers and keeping our allocations to the AI theme because we believe that's important and can continue to drive forward. But by reducing those capital equipment exposures, we are taking down our risk and balancing um, any potential fallout from the situation. And so risks like these underscore the importance of a guiding hand in portfolio allocation and the criticality of individual security selection um, as we move forward through these events. So to conclude on this slide, I know I spent a lot of time here, but it's very important. I wanna underscore that the election and geopolitical risk, however uncertain that may be, it does remain a clear focus for us, and we're adjusting our positions to limit the downside risk should we see the worst occur. So moving into some of our election themes, the next concept I'd like to introduce are the three key components that we see as long-term implications from the elections in November. And it's an easy acronym. Um, it's triple T. I'm sure you'll hear us say it a lot over the next couple of months. But it includes tariffs, taxes, and treasuries. So on this page, if we start with tariffs, I did mention the Biden administration's extension of Trump's tariffs against China, but also adding in new Chinese tariffs, which are outlined in the left-hand side. So most notably, we've seen electric vehicle tariffs increase beyond about 100%, and Trump's administration has even proposed a 200% level as a counter. And that effectively neutralizes the threat of Chinese electric vehicles being dumped onto the U.S. market. But on the right-hand side, you can see that the overall economic impact is likely small from these new tariffs. But it is the first tangible step to leverage tariffs as November approaches. So the key isn't necessarily what's happening now, but what might have to happen if either campaign promises additional tariffs. And if we take a look at some of the policy proposals on the table, you can see those on the right-hand side. No matter what, it looks like the country is in for an increase in total tariff rates across the board. So in the chart on the left, you can see we're running at about a 2% rate right now. But even if we had the most benign scenario, the easiest policy out there, it would still jump to about 6.3%, which is a near tripling of the tariff rate. Um, and that can be very inflationary. So let's look at some of those potential impacts. They can manifest themselves in a couple of different ways. So. The first, and this is in keeping with our calls for rates to say high, increased tariffs certainly don't help us with the inflation issue. So we could see some impacts across consumer prices, real income, and ultimately consumption. Um, we know from 2016 and 2017 that we could also see some retaliatory tariffs um, on the board. And if you think about what we just discussed with the Mexican presidential elections, it's easy to see how all of these events uh, truly kind of combine uh, to create an outcome. And so if the U.S. doesn't continue to increase trading outside of China, it could spell trouble for growth um, if the tariff situation does get out of hand. We could also see some indirect impacts, and these could be tighter financial conditions, uh, poor sentiment, and supply chain disruptions. But I do want to underscore that we did see tariffs increase in 2017, and the market did still power ahead. So tariffs alone, in our opinion, um, can't explain a potential pullback in growth unless they become completely unreasonable. Um, and tariffs do collect revenue, which is helpful for deficits, which we're going to talk about. But we are wary of the political aspects for tariffs um, and the potential ex escalation that could take place as we get closer to November. And so moving on to the second T, um, and this is taxes, this is going to be one of the biggest issues that comes up in 2025, and that's the Tax Cuts and Job Act, or the TCJA. So this represents a massive tax cliff. Um, as many of these tax breaks will expire without changes from Congress. And the best quote that I've seen on this um, comes, comes in like this. It's that the 2025 decision will affect virtually all aspects of the tax code and the vast majority of American taxpayers. So it's a very big deal. And on this slide here, you can see the impact on baseline revenues. So those revenues are in the dark blue. And if the TCJA is extended, you see that it's quite a bit of money, quite a bit of difference as a percentage of GDP. And so proposals from each party are becoming a little bit more clear, but they still aren't fully understood. So for Biden, it appears that there could be higher taxes on the wealthy and corporations, which would pay for extensions and middle-class tax breaks for those middle-class Americans making less than $400,000. But the corporate implications are a little bit less clear. 
Trump has also called for sweeping tax cuts that would impact most Americans and corporations, but we don't have any specifics on that other than the support for the tariffs um, and the procedures and policies that he's uh, proposed there. But the cog in the machine for both candidates gets back to sort of the third T, um, but it's gonna, it's gonna be what happens with the deficit and treasury issuance. So if the TCJ is extended, and you can see on this slide, it means that there'll be an additional $3.2 trillion in deficit spending annually by 2034. Um, and already the amount of US Treasury issuance that we see um, has skyrocketed. So this continued pressure under either candidate is going to have implications for government finances and interest rates. And from a positioning perspective, when we think about fixed income in the muni market, um, this could be an opportune time at these level of interest rates to be investing there. And Mike will talk about that a little bit more. So that's a good segue into the last T, so Treasury issuance. Um, so if we bring tariffs and taxes together, this is really where we end up. And so what you can see on this page is that we are expecting an annual increase in Treasury issuance um, that will expand by about $1 trillion by 2029. And most of that increase is coming from notes and bonds, the only thing to understand there is that's all of the issuance that's beyond one year. And so tackling the deficit will arguably be one of the biggest problems facing Congress um, and the presidential administration in 2025. And that brings us back to how entrenched our view is that the 10-year U.S. Treasury is likely to stay elevated above 4% through 2025, despite a likely easing campaign coming from the Federal Reserve. And to touch on it here briefly, one of the things I hear a lot from clients is concern around who's going to buy the increased Treasury issuance. Um, so we've broken that down for you here on this slide. Um, in the current news, it's been indicated that China has reduced their holdings of Treasury debt, and they've been using those proceeds to diversify away from U.S. dollars. And that's one of the reasons that we saw gold spike substantially toward the end of Q1. But U.S. domestic buyers, you can see that in the yellow, have picked up the slack based upon the amount of money and capital um, in the market. And so as a share of outstanding debt, if you look at the right-hand side, domestic holders have gone from about 30% to about 48%, while foreign holders have dropped their holdings from a peak of nearly 60% to just 33% of the total. And because U.S. domestic investors, in our opinion, and these could be mutual funds, banks, and households, because they're more price sensitive, we do believe that rate volatility is here to stay and it will present tactical portfolio opportunities for the rest of 2024 and as we move into 2025. And so my last topic to address here is what we're all hearing about global central bank divergence. Um, so this just means that central banks might be cutting rates um, at different speeds. And so these differences may appear slight, but it's becoming more clear to us that the Federal Reserve will start cutting rates later than other central banks around the world. Uh, in fact, if you look at the right-hand side, what you can see is that emerging market countries, many of those easing cycles are already underway. And that can explain some of the near-term performance spikes that we've seen in emerging market countries. We're not there yet for non-US developed markets, uh, but June does appear to be the jumping off point for the global easing cycle to start there. And what this could do is add a boost to developed market growth at a time when U.S. growth is set to slow. And what that may lead to is what we're calling a global growth convergence. So if you take a look at this slide, in the dark blue, we have U.S. growth that's coming down slowly, while at the same time, we have developed Europe um, and Japan coming up in terms of those growth expectations. So to be clear, we do believe that U.S. growth will continue to run at a faster rate relative to international developed markets but the pace of easing has the potential to correct the growth path across many developed market economies. And that satisfies a key condition that I talked about last time for investing outside of the US, and that's a sustainable source of growth. So we still need more clarity around currency interactions, and we'd like to see a bit more of a resolution on the geopolitical front, but this is top of mind for us as we discuss implications for our portfolios and asset allocation potentially out of the US. And so just to summarize the key takeaways here, you know, we do think that global elections and geopolitics will continue to impact the outlook. Um, we do believe CNR is well positioned to weather the impact of China and Taiwan, and we're making portfolio adjustments to be in line with that now. I also talked about the triple T's, so really focusing in on tariffs, taxes, and treasuries as long-term impacts from the election instead of being so focused on the short term. 
And then we also think global central bank policy moving forward may impact international growth rates, and that could increase the attractiveness of international markets. And so I'll stop here in my opening section. What we wanted to do today was give the audience an opportunity to get questions in when the speakers uh, were, were speaking. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Amber, um, and she's gonna shoot in a question from you uh, that's coming during my comments. Great, thank you, Charles. Um, so we appreciate you focusing on the longer term views and concerns that relate to the election, not only in the US, but several that are occurring all over the globe. Can you address what investors might expect in the market through the end of the year? Sure. So when we look at indications for short term volatility, and I was actually on, on a panel this morning discussing this, it does show that the market expects to see movement in November. Um, and it's happening a lot earlier than in past cycles. We also know that the election is going to be very close. And so we're seeing a lot of these market based volatility measures continue to spike after the election. And so when we're thinking about the short term, what I like to do is go back to goals and asset allocation. Um, and so I've said many times in a lot of my public comments that the opportunity set now across asset classes is wider than it's been for about 15 years. So there's a lot of dispersion, there's a lot of opportunity. So what we wanna do to get ahead of this volatility is position portfolios to be durable in the midst of that volatility while still keeping our toe in the market based on current trends and earnings, which I'll discuss in the equity section. Um, we certainly know from 2016 how volatile uh, markets can be around elections, and we should expect that, but we can't position portfolios expecting the worst. Uh, so right now our message is to stay the course uh, and really focus on the long-term issues. Great, thank you. It's definitely an interesting time. Um, so now we're gonna turn it over to Paul Single. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Amber. Yeah, in terms of the economy, uh, one thing has been very clear is the fact that we have seen economic growth so much stronger in the United States relative. Uh, last month, we talked about that, where growth was uh, close to 9% since the recession ended in the United States, and the rest of the world was less than half that. Uh, these charts here just focus on where that growth is coming from. On the left-hand side is the chart showing the consumption portion of GDP, and that's really been the driving force. Uh, consumption in the last few years has gone up 3.7%. We're in total for an average annual rate. Compare that to overall GDP, which is about a full percentage point, it's showing that uh, the consumption part is really uh, punching above its weight. But the chart on the left-hand side just shows how consumption has changed uh, since the end of the recession. And it compares that to the past five recessions. The light blue dash line is the average and the gray area is the range. So you can see that uh, consumer spending has been that driving force that we talked about. But the thing is, is that we expect that pace to slow down. Uh, one, wage gains are not as strong as they've been in the past, plus the amount of people being hired is not as strong as what we've seen. Furthermore, uh, savings have been depleted to some extent, but more importantly, what we're seeing is a maturing of the business cycle, in which case people don't spend as much money as they had in the past. I mean, it was rip-roaring in terms of the pace of uh, spending that we saw over the last few years. And we've seen this back in the past in history, following the end of World War II, when 12 million troops were returning and the rationing was over, uh, people spent an awful lot of money celebrating what life was like and having a return of normalcy, much like what we saw after the pandemic. Back then after World War II, inflation shot up, but then came down relatively quickly. And then the few years that followed, people just got back to a normal life. And that's what we expect to see going forward. On the right-hand side, we're taking a look at personal income and spending. This is monthly data that's by the same people that calculate uh, GDP. And we adjust it for inflation, just like the GDP net numbers are. But you can see the light blue line, which is spending, that's continued on the same sort of trajectory it was on before the pandemic. But the pace of income has fallen. Uh, people continue to spend more and keep that pace going, the light blue line, but the dark blue line is very different. As a result, we expect to see that return to a much more normal relationship compared to what we've had in the past. So that's why uh, expectations for GDP growth this year is a little bit slower than what it was in the past few years. In terms of how people are spending their money, uh, the shaded area here is overall spending, and you can see how it has changed um, since 2021. 
And we chose this as the start date because 2020 was extremely volatile with the massive layoffs and the rehiring. This was more of a normal period. But you can see how people had spent their money. Uh, the gray area, which is services, is the major portion of spending. It's 65% of overall spending. But if you look over on the right-hand side, that's starting to plateau out. The dark blue line is durable goods. And you can see that's a little bit below what the peak was a year ago. And that probably has an awful lot to do with the fact that financing costs are so high. The light blue line is non-durable goods, and that continues on pretty much a stable trajectory because that's just not influenced by changes in the business cycle as much. But in terms of people being able to pay for all of their spending, it's worked out quite well. Uh, in terms of household leverage, there are a number of measurements that are used to determine this. The chart on the left shows overall debt load uh, for a household. And you can see that it's above the long-term average, but it's below what we've been seeing for the last 20 years or so. Plus, keep in mind that this chart goes back to the 1950s. Debt wasn't as big of a part of people's lifestyle as it is now. I mean, credit cards really didn't become popular until the 1980s. But the more important number is the one on the right-hand side. And this is the obligation of what people have to pay each month. The chart on the left would be the size of the overall mortgage. The chart on the right would be what that monthly mortgage payment is. And you can see that this number is near historic low levels. So as a result, the financial basis for many people spending continues to be solid, even though we expect the growth to slow in coming months. Another reason for that is that we're seeing moderation in labor gains. And this is a really important factor, and it's very special to the Fed because what they're trying to do by raising interest rates is slow down the pace of hiring because that strong pace of hiring caused wages to move up, which caused inflation to move up. But you can see on the chart here on the left-hand side, the columns are the monthly change, which tends to be volatile. So the dark blue line that you see is a six-month moving average. The dash line is what it averaged for the five years before the pandemic, something that's relatively normal. And you can see that we're returning to that sort of level. So the, the supply and demand of workers comes closer, and as a result, inflationary pressures won't be nearly as strong. And that is supported by other data that we see. Most notable is the fact that the amount of job openings is diminished significantly from the peak of about two years ago when the Fed started to raise interest rates. Both public data, the JOLTS data, which comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, along with private data from Indeed, are showing the same thing. The amount of job openings has been slowing compared to what we've seen in the past few years. But more importantly, the amount of job switchers is dropped significantly. This is really important. These are people that move from one job to another job, mainly because they can get paid an awful lot more. And we saw that with the reopening of the economy. And that's what helped push wages up back then. But the amount of people switching jobs has stabilized and it's back to levels that we saw before the pandemic. And that's helping to reduce the pressure on wages, which you can see on the right hand side where we're looking at the three most popular measurements of wages. And you can see that it's returning towards that level that the Fed would like to see that they view as consistent with 2% inflation. In terms of inflation, um, it's moderating from the very high levels, but the thing is, is, is it moderating at a level uh, that's still too high for the Fed? In this case, the dark black line that you see here is CPI, which is at 3.4%, a little bit below what the core CPI number of 3.6%. But in terms of what's causing that inflation, you can see it's focused heavily in two areas. The dark blue is shelter costs, what CPI calls housing. And the light blue is auto insurance. Both of these are contributing the majority of inflation. If it weren't for those two components, inflation would just be seven tenths of a percent. But we do have those components, and that's why uh, it's important to understand what's going on. In terms of looking at shelter costs first, uh, the columns here are the monthly change. The light blue line is the three month change annualized to give us the recent trend. And of course, the dark blue is the year over year number. And the year-over-year -year number of the three-month change is still too high, between 5 to 5.5%. And, and that's because the monthly change, you can see, um, using the right index, has been coming in around four-tenths of a percent. And four-tenths of a percent, you know, annualized, you're 
talking close to 5%. It's still a high number. Look at what it was before the pandemic. You can see it was a much lower rate of around 3 to 3.5% or so. Uh, the thing is, as the Fed's raising interest rates has slowed down the demand for homes and people moving, and that has brought down inflation significantly. But we have a strong economy going on at the same time. And as a result, the demand is still there, and that's what's keeping the pressure. But it is moving in the right direction. Um, as many Fed policymakers have said, it's just a slow-moving uh, move towards that 2% goal. In terms of how um, the shelter inflation is calculated, it's based heavily on what it costs to rent uh, a property, um, because owning a property is different. There's an investment um, part, and that component can be very powerful. So they try to subtract it out, and they look at rentals. The way we can look at rentals is just taking a look at some of the survey data. And you can see that on the left-hand side, the year-over-year -year change. You can see the explosion and the growth in the cost uh, increase in rentals, and that's mainly people moving away from uh, expensive cities to other cities, and that pushed up the price because of the limited supply. The year-over-year -year change has moderated significantly. And the dark blue line is how CPI calculates the shelter costs, and you can see that's starting to come down. But the thing is, it's not coming down as fast a pace, mainly because it hasn't caught up with the increases of the past. And you can see that in the data here on the right-hand side. It's the exact same data presented differently. In this case, we've indexed it since the, right before uh, the recession started. And you can see the light blue line is the market levels, and the dark blue line is the CPI. It's still catching up. So this is telling us that it will be a slow pace to get back to gains of just around 2% or so. In terms of insurance, auto insurance has taken off. Uh, this chart here, as you can see, the dark uh, line, uh, that's showing the year-over-year -year change, close to 23%. The columns are the three-month change. Again, pretty much the same sort of level. Look at what it was before the pandemic. You can see that it was just averaging just under 4%. So these numbers are much different than what we've been accustomed to. And, of course, it's part of what shocks many people in terms of inflationary pressures. But the reason why inflation is so high is, in, is a number of things. One, um, inflation is regulated. Uh, each state has um, uh, regulations in terms of what can be charged. And insurance companies have to prove that they've lost money to raise rates. And during the pandemic, when things slowed down quite a bit, they didn't lose a whole lot of money because people weren't driving as much. But once the roads and people's lifestyles started to return back to normal, they started to drive and they weren't as experienced and the accident rate moved up quite a bit. Furthermore, labor costs to fix those repairs is a whole lot higher because wages have moved up. And the cost of components are very expensive now. You know, 10 years ago, to replace a bumper, bumper was just a piece of steel. Now it's a piece of plastic with an awful lot of sensors on it, and that's very, very expensive. So insurance is very high and will probably stay high uh, well into the next year. Furthermore, the Fed has very little control over these because monetary policy doesn't impact these. So it makes it difficult to bring down inflation when they can't control the prices as much as other parts of the um, economy. But overall, um, our view is that economic growth will continue on a positive trajectory. Even with monthly gains at a lower level, it's stronger than what's considered that um, 100,000 level, which is considered something that is needed for positive growth. That's an important threshold. And as a result, people will continue to spend, but not as strong a pace as what we've seen. And inflationary pressures uh, will con continue to moderate and move down towards the Fed's goal of a sustainable 2% level. So our outlook remains quite positive for the economy. Amber? Thank you, Paul. Um, you emphasize the strength of the consumer, which is obviously very positive for the economy. How has this impacted the household savings rate? And what are the implications around that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I get that a lot when I give speeches because I show the savings rate. The savings rate's actually quite low. Uh, it, it's calculated. It's a very simple calculation. It's the disposable income that you receive. So it's the money that households receive after they've paid their taxes and what they spent money on. And it's the diff differential. Um, it's nothing more than that. It's very, very simple. So it's a cash flow number. And it's around 3.2% 
which is about half the level it averaged for the five years or so before the pandemic were very, very stable, uh, north of 6%. And to me, this is a very important indicator in terms of how people really feel about the economy, because this is where the rubber hits the road. You know, if people were worried about the economy, they would increase their savings. Um, if they were not worried about their economy, then they would keep it quite low. And it is low, not because people aren't earning enough money to save if they wanted to. I mean, the unemployment rate's been below 4% for well over two years. Um, this is a solid economy. Uh, people are just confident. They're confident in their job. They're confident in their income gains. And they're confident about their outlook. So that's why they're spending money. They've accumulated an awful lot of wealth because the value of their financial assets have rallied quite a bit over the last few years. The value of their home has increased significantly over the last few years. So the reason why the savings rate is so low really has to do with a confidence number that people uh, feel good about the economy. Great, thank you, Paul. That's a uh, really good perspective. Uh, next up, we have Mike who will discuss fixed income and fixed income markets. Great, thank you, Amber, and hello, everybody. So let's jump right in and start today with the chart on the left here, which graphs the yield of the 10-year Treasury. And as you can see, you know, it's this volatility theme that is one of the, the consistent factors in the market, and it's something that we've been talking about for quite some time. So with the yield at, at just over 4.5% today, you know, this is an increase of about 70 basis points or so year-to-date, and this really reflects a, a repricing in rates as the markets have adjusted to strong growth, lingering inflation, and you know, a, a reassessment of when the Fed is going to start cutting rates. And we've been calling for rates to remain higher for longer, and, and Charles walked through some of the pressures supporting this outlook. And if we look at the chart on the right, you know, we graph the tenure again and overlay this with our own, tre uh, with our own tenure treasury model. And this further supports you know, this has further support for this thesis. So we continue to believe that, that rates are at fair value within this range of 4.1 to 4.6%, and that with yields at these levels and with the Fed likely to begin easing in the second half of the year, it is a good time to be putting money to work further out the curve. Now, you might think that, you know, with yields so high, issuance might be down year over year, but that's really not the case. And so the chart on the left here, it looks at issuance in the investment grade and high yield segments of the corporate bond market. And what we see here is that even with these higher rates, corporate borrowers have ramped up debt issuance. So investment grade borrowing is up 37% year over year. It's the second highest total on record. And high yield issuance is up 92%. And what we see is that borrowers are taking advantage of tight spreads and strong corporate earnings to access the markets. But more importantly, investors are returning to the bond market because they feel confident putting, to money, putting money to work at, at what are really attractive yields. So it's also noteworthy that 81% of high yield issuance is being used to refinance older debt. And so the chart on the right here shows that since the end of 2022, the amount of high yield debt maturing in 2024 has declined by 48 billion and another 88 billion in 2025. So in total, issuers have refinanced about $200 billion in debt and pushed those maturity dates further out into the future. And so this refi activity, it's, it's eased concerns about fears around this maturity wall. And, and it's shown that lower rated borrowers have access to the capital markets, and really this is being supported again by strong demand from investors. Now, if we turn to the muni market, we're seeing a similar story here. You know, again, you know, high rates haven't held back issuance. Through mid-May, we've seen roughly a 40% increase versus last year, and it's one of the strongest starts in over a decade. And so, you know, issuance had been light in the muni market because borrowers had been utilizing pandemic relief aid, but we're seeing capital needs starting to emerge again, and, and it's a little bit of a, a catch-up period that we're seeing in the muni market. So about 70% of this is new money, 30% is refunding, and, and it's very similar to the taxable market. Demand has been very robust with attractive yields, and then high taxes are really driving interest in this market. 
And so the question now turns to, you know, how is this supply impacted valuations? And on this slide, we're looking at the intermediate corporate bond index. And this index, it's structured with investment grade bonds with one to 10 year maturities. And the dark blue line, it traces the yield going back 20 years. The light blue line shows the credit spread. And you can see it's at just, just around 75 basis points. And this is below the longer term average of 134. So what's important here is that while valuations might seem rich on a spread basis, if we look back historically, say to the 2004-2007 period, for example, you can see that tight spreads, they can stay in this range for some time. And, and again, it's about the current environment of strong growth, moderating inflation. This is going to help keep balance sheets strong. And once again, with absolute yield high, you know, market demand can continue to support these valuations. And then on this next slide, we'll pivot and, and take a look at the muni market. You know, here we're comparing the yield on, again, it's on the intermediate corporate index to three similarly structured municipal bond indices. And the first bar here is the general market index. And we would consider this applicable for investors that are in a state with no taxes, like Nevada or Texas. And then we have this followed by New York and California, where, where state tax rates are high. And so the dark blue shows the municipal yield for each. And while these yields are lower than the corporate index, if, for example, we adjust that general market muni yield to account for a, a maximum federal tax bracket, this translates to a taxable equivalent yield of 6%. And what this means is that a taxable bond would need to yield 6% in order to provide the same after-tax yield provided by owning a municipal bond. If we do the same exercise for New York and California, the benefit of, of owning a municipal in these states is even greater. And then aside from the, the, the current benefit of owning municipals, as Charles mentioned and touched on in his opening comments, you know, we're, we're closely watching to see if that the TCJA is going to be allowed to expire. And if it does, that would return the top federal tax rate to 39.6 from 37% today. And again, if this were to happen, this would create even more of an advantage to own municipals, especially for those that reside in those high tax states. And then finally, when we're looking at market yields, you know, it's important to note that, you know, we're in a much different environment today versus a few years ago when yields were hovering around 1% to 2%. And so aside from just enjoying these high levels of income that we're seeing today, a secondary effect is that these higher income streams cushion a portfolio from market volatility, and we really see a much better risk-reward trade-off today. And so to show this, we run a scenario analysis, again, using that intermediate corporate index. And so the yield on the index was 5.7% when we ran this. Average maturity was about 47 and duration was 4. And, and just a reminder that in this context, duration is a measure that helps us gauge sensitivity of a bond to changes in interest rates. And so if we look at scenario one, and, and we assume that yields don't change over the next 12 months, an investor is going to earn their yield, and your total return will be about 5.6%. Under scenario two, if yields were to increase 1%, and, and to provide a little context here, we've seen this happen one time to this index in the last 15 calendar years. So it's rare, but it can happen. You'll see a negative price return, but income now compensates you for this loss, and you end up with a positive return of 2.3%. And then under scenario three, if yields decline 1%, price return and income combine for a total return close to 9%. And so the key takeaway here is that if yields move up or if they move down, it's this distribution of returns that remains positive across all scenarios. And so with the next move from the Fed likely to be a rate cut, you know, this argues for, for extending maturities further out the curve. And so before moving on, you know, the key takeaways here, right, that the higher for longer thesis is going to continue to play out. You know, attractive nominal yields are offering opportunities across the curve. 
increasing supply and narrow spreads have been met with robust demand. You know, and, and there's a lot and strong voter confidence or strong a strong vote of confidence, I think, for the market. Municipal bonds offer compelling value, especially for those in high tax brackets. And then these high levels of income suggest risk reward. The risk reward balance is much more favorable today and, and favors extending maturities. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Amber. Great. Thank you, Mike. So you discussed how yields across the curve will be impacted when Fed cuts. Um, when the Fed cuts short-term rates. When considering the divergence in clients' goals from short-term cash management to cash flow and income needs, is it strategic to move to extend for all? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I, I like to kind of de decompose this, this question into, into two parts. And so the first part is, is really for clients with liquidity needs. So whether they need liquidity in one month, six months, or, or even out one or two years, you know, there are really good opportunities in the market to keep money you know, active on the front end of the curve. So short-term T-bills, they're yielding you know, around 540, you know, and the two-year treasury is around 5%. You can pick up a little spread if you go into the corporate market. And then we're even seeing attractive opportunities in short munis again with, with one to two-year paper earning, you know, north of three and a quarter percent. So it, it's, you know, it, it's still a good time for those, those short duration type portfolios with liquidity needs. You know, and there's really no need to, to stretch out the curve for income. But we have to remember that, you know, it, it's these front end yields that are going to be impacted first when the Fed begins to lower rates. So maturities here and cash flows here ultimately will end up getting reinvested at, at lower yields. And so what we know is that when, you know, when the Fed is paused and with rate cuts coming, longer duration is going to outperform cash. And so with, you know, if you're thinking about an investor with a, a longer horizon, maybe a willingness to take on a little bit of volatility, and maybe they've been sitting on the sidelines enjoying these 5% money market yields, you know, we do think now is a good time to extend. So it, it's hard to time these things, but history has shown that, you know, it is best to, to start this before the Fed starts cutting rates. And, and what I think is really powerful about, I'm going to go back a slide here, about, you know, about this slide here is that, you know, we're really able to achieve these really nice income streams without venturing too far out on the curve. And, you know, we do have some cushion if rates move higher. And, and really this, this allows us to be able to participate, you know, with some price appreciation if, if rates do decline. Great. Thank you, Mike. That's super helpful. Okay, we're going to go back to Charles, who will cover our last section of the webinar that will be de dedicated to the equity market. Great. Thanks, Amber. Um, so turning now to the equity markets, uh, where we wanted to start and, and underscore this concept is that there's really been a broadening of market participation that's occurred here in 2024. Um, and that's even with the sharp moves that we saw in some tech stocks you know, post Q1 earnings. And so if you take a look at these charts, you can see 2023 performance on the left-hand side plotted against what we've seen so far in 2024 year to date. Uh, so notably, there's a, there's a lot lower divergence across sectors and even some of the underperforming sectors uh, over 2023, uh, like energy, have definitely gained some momentum this year. Um, and so clearly there's still a major advance happening in technology. Uh, we're seeing that at 13, around 13% but it's certainly not as, as concentrated um, as it was back in 2023. And then adding additional elements uh, to this um, and looking at, at potential market rotation, we're starting to see signs of a broadening in earnings expectations. So if we take a look at the blockbuster earnings in 2023 for tech, it peaked in Q4 with about a 78% run rate. And that was relative to just 1% for the rest of the S&P 500. But right now, it looks like technology is going to be facing a lot tougher comparisons as we move forward. And so we're seeing a broader ramp up in the S&P 500, uh, excluding energy, um, where the tables may be flipped here in Q3. Uh, so if you look at 19% in terms of expected earnings for technology relative to 32% for the broader market in Q3. So to us, this bodes very well for a continued rally in stocks. Um, and we do think that there's even the potential to see a handoff in market leadership as we move through 2024. And I'd also like to note that valuations excluding the MAG7 are much more moderate. Um, and we certainly don't believe that valuation alone is the only component that matters. 
Uh, but if momentum does pick up here in the S&P 500 um, outside of technology, uh, we do think we're going to continue to see some money flow in that direction that will continue to broaden the rally. What I also wanted to do today was give you an update on our mid cap stock recommendation um, and just talk through how that trade has gone since February. Um, and so overall, that tactical adjustment that we put in place has performed in line with the market since February. You can see that on the right hand side. Uh, the yellow line um, is mid cap stocks or our blend. Um, and then the blue line is the S&P 500. And certainly at times um, we did have some outperformance in that trade. And I wanted to go back and underscore you know, our case for mid cap, which we still believe in. Um, and that includes valuations that are very attractive on a relative basis to the S&P 500 broadly. We have revenues that are US centric. Um, so it plays into our theme of higher growth here in the US. And then we have tailwinds potentially in small cap stocks because borrowers in that range tend to have more exposure to short term interest rates. So if we do see the Federal Reserve start to cut interest rates, that could be a tailwind for small cap stocks. And then as we know, traditionally, small caps and mid caps are more sensitive uh, to earnings if the economy does pick up in the back half of the year. Um, so the trade for us and the recommendation is still very much intact. Um, we continue to like um, the allocation there. And then moving into valuations, um, we went back to a framework here that we had used pre-pandemic. Um, and so as I mentioned before, PE valuation alone uh, does help to understand absolute performance. Um, if you think about it in terms of lower PEs, which would typically indicate higher total returns relative to uh, sort of lower or higher <laughs> PEs corresponding to lower returns. But overall valuation is a really poor predictor of market pullbacks and overall direction, especially in a vacuum. Um, and so that just because valuation is high doesn't mean the market can't continue to run. And so what we put together here was the chart of the Case-Shiller PE ratio uh, going back over time. And then in different ranges, we've shown forward returns over one year, two year, five year, and 10 year holding periods. And so if you look at the yellow box, that's where we are today between 30 and 40 on a broad basis. So directionally, there is still room for the S&P 500 to move higher. Um, I will note that at an 11% advance so far this year, um, if we take it back to what we talked about with elections, this is the best performance that we've seen um, in a year four election year uh, so far over history at 11%. Um, so we do think that there's some potential here based on the foundation and a lot of what we talked about for the rally to continue. So ultimately the market isn't cheap, um, but we just wanna stress that valuation is only one data point. Um, and we don't think that it's telling the full story right now, especially if you take, it to, take a look at the dispersion between technology and the rest of the S&P 500. And so the last comment that I wanted to make is, is on our CNR core equity positioning. Um, so taking a look at areas where we're overweight, so we own more of those stocks than the index, and then looking at areas where we're underweight. Um, so if you think about our financials, which is over on the left-hand side and the position that we have there, it might surprise you. What that's actually showing in terms of that overweight um, is that there was a reclassification um, of some digital payment system companies from technology into financials. Um, and we still very much like the story around digital payments, and we do continue to think that those companies will do well. So we've maintained that exposure and that position there in the strategy. Um, if you think about our industrial positions, you know, our view um, is that industrial infrastructure investments and energy investments are going to spark overall industrial activity, especially as we see uh, supply chains and local sourcing really becoming something um, that's going to be a long-term trend and reduce op operational risk for corporations. And then if we move to our underweight, so areas where we don't own as much exposure relative to the broad index, you can see that on the far right-hand side here, we are underweight the tech sector broadly, but we do have a 1.7% overweight to semiconductor companies. So going back to the comments, uh, with the geopolitical in China, Taiwan, right? We have exposure to the AI design companies and those uh, um, capital uh, manufacturing companies. Um, and so it is diversified across those areas where we think uh, the market is really being driven by AI and technology. Um, so exposure there, even though we're underweight the entire uh, technology sector. And then from a real estate perspective and materials, uh, we think there's a lot of interest rate exposure uh, to real estate that can cause a lot of volatility. And that's not where we want to take on interest rate volatility inside of our equity strategies. And then from a materials perspective, there's certainly a lot of commodity exposure there, uh, which can be uh, extremely volatile, especially as we enter the summer period 
Um, and we don't want to have that high volatility um, inside of the equity portfolio being generated there. So I'm going to pass it back to Amber and answer one more question. And I think we might have time for one or two questions more broadly. Great. Thanks, Charles. So while historic and traditional equity valuation metrics remain relevant, we can all agree that the landscape is evolving and adapting. Are we facing a fundamental shift in how we measure the under or overvalue of a market, a sector, or a stock? Yeah, that, that's an exceptional question. Um, and, I, and I start here. You know, it's, it's really not easy to catch shifts in the market. Um, and for valuation to, to really matter, the market does need a catalyst. So if we think about another way to say that, valuation gaps can exist for a very long period of time. Um, and secular changes can create these value traps. Um, and we've seen evidence of extended valuation differences across markets that can persist or even widen over time. So if I had to pinpoint a change um, or add in some additional metrics to what we need to consider, it is coming from the rapid development of technology. So if you think about corporate business models and how they've changed, they shifted their investment priorities from hard assets, so property, plant, and equipment, to intangible ones. Um, and so in many cases, the technology breakthroughs have significantly impacted existing businesses um, and sort of disintermediated um, some of those hard asset businesses. So I do think it's fair to say um, that a company with huge earnings potential may appear expensive just because the upfront investment in technology is so costly. But if you look at the back end growth ramp, it's enormous. Um, and if you attempt to kind of exclude these technology investments um, or the intangibles, it, it excludes the best part of a company. So it's not really valid for looking at cash flow um, and other earnings components. So ultimately, we step back. The most watched part of a company now is its growth rate. Um, and so if you can if you can prove that that's increasing quickly, um, it's always going to lead to a higher valuation. Um, and it's just in this market that market technology is really separating the rapid growth companies from stable growth um, and rapid growth right now is winning. Great, thanks Charles. So we have a few minutes left to ask a couple questions. Thank you to all the participants that have submitted them during the webinar. Um, so Paul, I'm gonna ask you the first question. Can you dive into the consumer spending by income level and have we seen any diversions there? Um, yeah, there is some data uh, that's out uh, that the government has. It tends to be dated. Uh, I think the most recent is 2022, but it breaks it into quintiles in terms of how people have spent the, the, the money over the last few years. Since the pandemic um, ended, uh, the bottom two quintiles have had a bigger increase in spending than the top two quintiles. And they don't, and they look at the top two, not just one in the bottom two and not just one because the extremes of, of either end. But it's interesting to see that. Uh, but it also makes sense um, in terms of income to the bottom two quartile, or quintiles, excuse me. Um, we, we, they tended to get uh, stimulus checks. They also tended to get other benefits that were uh, from the federal government and state governments to help support income. And when they get the income um, and they spend it, it tends to be a bigger change in the quality of life than you would see at the other end of the income stream. So it's pretty consistent with um, what people would think. Uh, they've been able to spend more money um, and also um, benefiting from uh, the, the increases in the government. Plus the wages moved up much more than at the higher end of the income stream. Great, thank you. Okay, Charles, you're gonna bring us home with one additional question. It seems that the uh, US equity market is somewhat shrugged off global elections. Do you see this changing at all? And again, you kind of mentioned our allocation um, and perspective on the global markets, but do you see it changing in the near future? Yeah, so I, I would agree, Amber. I, I do think that the market has generally shrugged off a lot of the potential impacts um, that are really unknowns out there in the market. Um, and if you compare that with the fact that we had a big adjustment uh, to what the Fed could potentially do as far as interest rate cuts, it does seem like the market could be a little vulnerable here, but it hasn't priced that in. Um, so the way that I think about that is when I back up and look at the landscape and try to pair off what's gonna happen with the Fed here in the US, what's gonna happen with central banks globally and the direction of growth. The question is, is when I get a pullback and some of those issues maybe show themselves or start to be discounted, closer into November, then I have a major opportunity to reposition my portfolio 
because I know we have solid underlying credit fundamentals and we have great earnings trajectory. Um, so I sort of view a lot of these risks um, that they're certainly being discussed. We have our clients that are talking about them that are wanting to know what the potential impact can be, but we haven't had a lot of adjustment. But going back to those fundamentals, I think will give us a really nice opportunity to increase some of that risk exposure um, if we do see a little bit of a pullback. Great. Okay, thank you all for joining us. A brief survey will pop up shortly in your console, so please share your feedback and suggestions for future topics. A replay of the session will be available within 24 hours and you will receive an email letting you know how to access it. Uh, from all of us, we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you.